Hello friends and welcome to my channel. Today we'll be learning about the radius. The radius. The radius is the lateral bone of the forearm and is homologous with the tibia of the lower limb. It has an upper end, a lower end and a shaft. Now how do we determine the side of this radius? As you can see, the upper end has a disc shaped head. It also bears a radial tuberosity, as you can see here. This is the radial tuberosity. While the lower end is expanded and has a styloid process. This is a styloid process. This should always face laterally, that is away from the body. The styloid process of the radius should face laterally. This is the basis for the side determination. The posterior surface of the lower end of the radius presents a tubercle called the dorsal tubercle of Lister as you can see here. This is another basis for the determination of the side of the radius. Now let's try keeping this radius on our right hand. You will notice that the styloid process is facing medially which shouldn't be the case. So let's try keeping this styloid process towards the lateral side in this manner. But you will notice that the Lister's tubercle is facing posteriorly which also shouldn't be the case. So we try keeping this on our left hand. In this you will notice that the styloid process is facing laterally. The anterior part is expanded and is facing anteriorly. The head of the radius which is rounded is facing upwards and the deltoid tuberosity is facing anteriorly. Even the Lister's tubercle is facing posteriorly in this manner. Therefore, we come to the conclusion that this radius is of the left side. Let's learn about the features of the radius. As I had said earlier, it has an upper end, a lower end and a shaft. Let's look at the features of the upper end. The upper end of the radius has a head which is disc shaped and covered with hyaline cartilage. Its superior surface is concave and articulates with the capitulum of the humerus to form the elbow joint. The circumference of the head is articular. It fits into a socket formed by the radial notch of the ulna and the annular ligament, thus forming the superior radioalna joint. The neck is enclosed by the narrow lower margin of the annular ligament. The head and the neck are free from capsular attachment and can rotate freely within the socket. The tuberosity lies just below the medial part of the neck. It has a rough posterior part and a smooth anterior part. Now let's learn about the shaft of the radius. It has three borders and three surfaces. This is the anterior border. This is the medial border. And this is the posterior border. The anterior border extends from the anterior margin of the radial tuberosity down to the styloid process right here. It is oblique in its upper half as you can see here and vertical in its lower half. It is crest like in its lowest part. The oblique part of the anterior border is called the anterior oblique line. This is the anterior oblique line. Now the posterior border is a mirror image of the anterior border. It is clearly defined only in its middle one third. The upper oblique part of the posterior border is called the posterior oblique line. Now the medial border is the sharpest border. It extends from the radial tuberosity above down to the posterior border of the ulna notch below. This is the posterior border of the ulna notch. The interosseous membrane is attached to the lower three-fourths of the medial border. Now let's look at the surfaces. The anterior surface lies between the medial border and the anterior border. This is the anterior surface. It presents a nutrient foramen in its upper part. This is the nutrient foramen. The posterior surface lies between the medial and the posterior borders. This is the posterior surface. 
The lateral surface lies between the anterior and the posterior borders. This is the lateral surface. It is roughened in its middle part. Now let's look at the lower end of the radius. It has five surfaces. The anterior surface is in the form of a ridge. The radial artery is palpated against this ridge. The posterior surface presents four grooves for the extensor tendons. It also has the tubercle of Lister. The medial surface presents the ulna notch. The lateral surface is prolonged downwards to form the styloid process. And the inferior surface presents a triangular area and a quadrangular area. The triangular area is for the articulation of the scaphoid bone, while the medial quadrangular area is for the articulation of the lunate bone. Before I start with the attachments on the radius, please note that the red color symbolizes the origin of muscles, the blue color symbolizes the insertion, and the green color represents the attachments of ligaments and joint capsules. Now let's learn about the attachments on the radius. The rough posterior part of the radial tuberosity gives insertion to the biceps brachii. The anterior part of the radial tuberosity is covered by a bursa. This is the lateral superficial view of the right upper limb. The muscle you see here is the biceps brachii. The quadrate ligament is attached to the medial part of the neck of the radius. The oblique cord is attached to the medial side just below the radial tuberosity, right here. This is the oblique cord and this is the quadrate ligament. This is the frontal section of the right elbow joint. The ligament you see here is the quadrate ligament. This is the oblique cord. Now looking at the attachments on the anterior border of the radius, the radial head of the flexor digitorum superficialis originates from the anterior oblique line and the upper part of the anterior border. This is the radial head of the flexor digitorum superficialis. This is a superficial view of the right upper limb. The muscle you see here is a flexor digitorum superficialis. The medial border or the interosseous border gives attachment to the interosseous membrane in its lower three-fourths. Now looking at the attachments on the surfaces, the anterior surface gives origin to the flexor pollicis longus in its upper two-thirds. This is the flexor pollicis longus and insertion to the pronator quadratus in its lower part. This is the pronator quadratus. This is the flexor pollicis longus. This is the anterior deep view of the right upper limb. The muscle you see here is the pronator quadratus. The lateral surface of the radius gives insertion to the supinator in its upper part, to the pronator teres in the middle and the brachioradialis in its lowest part just above the styloid process. This is the supinator muscle, this is the pronator teres and this is the brachioradialis. This is the supinator muscle. These are the slips of the pronator teres. This is the brachioradialis muscle. The posterior surface of the radius gives origin to the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. This is the abductor pollicis longus and this is the extensor pollicis brevis. The articular capsule of the wrist joint is attached to the anterior and posterior margins of the inferior articular surface. The articular disc of the inferior radioalna joint is attached to the lower border of the ulna notch. Now let's summarize the important attachments on the radius. The radial tuberosity gives insertion to the biceps in its rough posterior part. The anterior border gives origin to the FTS that is the flexor digitorum superficialis. The medial border gives attachment to the interosseous ligament. The anterior surface gives origin to the FPL and insertion to the PQ the flexor pollicis longus and the pronator quadratus. The lateral surface gives insertion to the supinator, the pronator teres and the brachioradialis. The posterior surface gives origin to the apple and EPB, that is the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. Now let us learn about the ossification of the radius. The radius has a primary center and a secondary center of ossification. The shaft ossifies from a primary center which appears during the 8th week of development. 
the lower end ossifies from a secondary center which appears during the first year and fuses at 20 years. It is the growing end of the bone. The upper end ossifies from a secondary center which appears during the fourth year and fuses at 18 years. I hope you found this video helpful. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.